I'm artist Lillian Gray, and I have a South African artist you simply have to meet, Mary Sabanda. Let's start by first looking at one of Mary Sabanda's artworks. What do you see? What work does this woman do? Is her dress African? What is her ethnicity? What color is the dress? Why is she knitting a Superman outfit? Is it for her or for someone else? What on earth is going on in this artwork? In order for you to truly understand the artwork of Mary Zabanda, we need to backtrack into history a bit, and I need to explain a few important concepts to you. Some of the concepts we need to revise and look at is colonialism, apartheid and its economic structure, freedom from apartheid and the first democratic election in South Africa in 1994, and the mantra, work hard and you will succeed. Concept number one, colonialism. What is colonialism? Colonialism occurs when one nation subjugates another nation often forcing their culture and their language upon the local population. During the age of discovery, a lot of European nations wanted to expand their influence by setting up colonies. These countries included Spain, Portugal, Germany, the Netherlands, Britain, and France. The motivation for colonialism could often boil down to these three things, God, gold, and glory. God in the sense that European colonizers believed that it was their duty to spread Christianity and its teachings. Gold in the sense that colonizers wanted to find trading routes and untapped natural resources. And glory in the sense that there was a bit of competition between the European nations to see who could set up the most colonies. Colonialists will arrive and observe the native culture of these new countries and say, hmm, you don't dress like me, you don't talk like me, you don't act like me, and you don't believe like me. But really, actually, you should. The settlers would start moving into the country and set out farms for them to start cultivating the land. To do all the hard manual labor of farming, they really needed farm workers. And this is the whole origin of the entire slave trade and the start of segregation, the separatedness between black and white. It's important to note that this happened all across the world, not just here in South Africa, but in America, in the Caribbean, um, in Africa, in India, everywhere the colonialists settled. Now, as with all things in life, colonialism wasn't just bad. There's always a positive and negative in every single situation. Host countries often invested into their colonies, into areas such as infrastructure and trade. Sometimes they would share their medical practices and technology as well. Technology such as guns, transportation and agricultural instruments. These are the positive side effects of colonialism. The negative side, however, is massive slave trade, landlords, land possession, and enforcing culture on another culture. Eventually, slave trade led to segregation, which led to apartheid. This brings me to point number two, apartheid and its economic incentives. It's important to realize that apartheid's architecture was because the white Afrikaners needed cheap labor for the mines. This created an interesting dynamic in the black culture where families would often live in their homeland, for example, the Transkei, and the father has to leave to go and live in Johannesburg to get work on the mines. And families and kids were often abandoned. Women were often employed as domestics, cleaning the large colonialists' houses. Eventually, there was a lot of protest against apartheid, and we see the freedom of Nelson Mandela and our first democratic election in 1994. Yay! This brings me to point number three, freedom. Everybody thought that this new, free, rainbow nation South Africa was like a magic wand that just could solve everybody's problems. Sadly, this wasn't true. And the born free generation, the generation born after 1994, is often disappointed with how South Africa turned out and that not much has really changed. 
this brings me to my last point, point number four. The mantra of just work hard and you will make it. This is a mantra that is often punted in modern society. However, it is not true. Melinda Gates argues in her book, The Moment of Lift, that if this statement was true, the richest people on the planet should be African mamas. They work incredibly hard, fetching water, carrying wood, looking after lots of children. So, now that you understand a little bit more about these four concepts, colonialism, apartheid and its economic motives, the freedom of South Africa, and the mantra of work hard and you will be rich, let's look at Marisa Banda's artwork again. Now, what do you see? We are seeing colonialism with a black woman dressed as a maid in a garment of servitude with a duck on her head and an apron. We see her wearing the blue dress that is not in an African style, but in a Victorian style, which talks about one culture imposing themselves on another. We see the failure of the current free South Africa and the fact that we still have a lot of domestic workers and people trapped in poverty. We see that hard work simply isn't enough. Where these domestics often care for white kids and then have to go late in the night or only on weekends to attend to their own households and their own children. But then we also notice something fantastical about it. A big Victorian dress, almost like a Cinderella born from the ashes, or Alice in Wonderland in a dream world. And there's some hope in this artwork. What is this all about? Let's go and meet Marie Zabanda, discover her life, and see what led to these stunning artworks. Marie Zabanda was born in Barberton in 1982 during apartheid in South Africa. Like a lot of black children back then, she was raised by her grandmother. She didn't know her father at all. He was in the SA army fighting the war. She only met him when she was 16. Her mother left for Johannesburg to go and find work as a domestic. Marisa Banda comes from a legacy of domestics. Her great-great-great-grandmother was a slave. Her great-grandmother was a domestic. Her grandma was a domestic. Her mother was a domestic. Was she going to be a domestic? Marie's mom worked really super hard and she saved whatever little money she had. She saved all this money so she could send her daughter to a good school. She didn't want her daughter to be a domestic as well. When asked about her childhood, Marie says, I had everything I needed and I went to a good high school which was multiracial. Many families couldn't afford to send their kid there, but I was fortunate that my mom was able to. And I guess that also pushed me into a certain direction. After school, Marie really wanted to become a fashion designer. So she set off to join her mom in Johannesburg so she could go and study. First, she did a diploma in fine arts at the Technikon of Witwatersrand in 2004. And then she obtained a B.Tech degree from the University of Johannesburg in 2007. Because of her mom being a domestic and her grandma and her great grandma, she really wanted to pay homage to the life of a domestic worker. And she created an alter ego called Sophie. Sophie is a domestic. And she is a life-size replicate of Marie's Banda's body. Back at university, when Marie originally started sculpting, Sophie was quite a small little figure. And she started making the sculptures bigger, bigger and bigger and eventually concluded that life size would be the most confrontational for the viewer to actually be engaged with the reality of the situation. You will notice Sophie's eyes are closed. It's because she is a domestic worker caught in a dream world. She dreams up a better life for herself. The character is in an imaginary state where she is finally free. In her dream, Sophie's working uniform is gradually transformed into a grand Victorian dress of the European elite. 
she transforms from being a maid to being the madam. In her dream, Sophie starts to take different roles. In each work, Sophie portrays different personas. One being a Victorian queen, another being a general who leads an entire army to victory. In another, she is a beautiful woman going to a ball, and at some point she's even a pope. Sophie is portrayed as a hero and a character full of strength and perseverance. Marie's first series with Sophie as the lead star was called Long Live the Dead Queen. These works were exhibited at the 2010 Venice Biennale. And Marie Sabanda also won the Standard Bank Artist of the Year Award. Long Live the Dead Queen was found in murals all over the city of Johannesburg in 2010. And it was amazing to see Marie literally make it this big. In these artworks, we can see how Marie combines her love for fashion with fine arts. Material also plays a very important part in Marie's fashion choices. The original blue color of Sophie's outfit is reminiscent of the blue overalls worn by the South African labor. She contrasts this overall material by creating a typical Victorian maid outfit and then transforming that into a beautiful Victorian dress. Marie plays with the stereotypes placed on black women. She is challenging them to dream again and she is sending a message of empowerment. Over the years through Marie's work, there's an evolution that takes place within Sophie. The first series, Long Live the Dead Queen, she was predominantly wearing blue. In the second series, The Purple Shall Govern, she was wearing purple. And in her latest work, Sophie is wearing red. As already stated, in the first series, Long Live the Dead Queen, the blue represents Cinderella, Alice in Wonderland, the blue overall associated with labor and a life of servitude. And Sophie is struggling with getting free and imagining an alternative life. In the second series, The Purple Shall Govern, Sophie has been emancipated. She is now a queen and a leader, and she's leading this army of embryos, her children, into a new future. And she's got this umbilical cord connecting her to the entire world. In the apartheid regime, people at protests were sprayed with purple ink to mark them so that the police could go and catch them after the protest. It's very difficult to get this particular ink off your body. But here, Sophie is wearing this purple almost as armor. It's become a part of her identity. And one of the graffitis that Marisa Banda saw in Soweto during the riots was the purple shall govern. One day they will rule South Africa. And here we see Sophie being a ruler. In her latest works, I came apart at the seams. We see red as a dominant color starting to feature. And in this time, Marie Zabanda is pregnant and she's expecting a child. And she's thinking of all these atrocities in the world and how she can fix them and what legacy is she going to leave behind. And this red is this passion, this desire to change the world. And she's got all these creatures and animals doing her bidding to make the world a better place. It is the color of blood, love, and passion. In this artwork, we can see that Purple Sophie is pregnant. She is cradling her belly. She is concerned about her child being born into this world. And she's literally sending out her red dogs to go and change the world. There's a desperateness that she needs to fix the problems of the world within nine months before this baby arrives. So how does Marie do it? How does she create these incredible pieces of art? When asked, she predominantly thinks of herself as a sculptor, but one of these artworks requires so much more. She combines sculpture, photography, design, fashion design, collage, and theatrics all together. She is a brilliant craftsman. First, she creates the sculpture actual Sophie model in a similar way that shop mannequins are made by first carving her out of clay then making a cast and then filling that cast with a resin or an acrylic then the shape of the body is removed from the mold 
is sanded down and given a matte powder coat black finish. Then she starts designing the outfit for Sophie and starts sewing the painstaking detail and then all the extras surrounding Sophie is also made whether it's embryos hanging from the roof or red dog sculptures charging towards the viewer. Photography also plays a major role in her artwork. Afterwards, her beautiful installations and sculptures are photographed professionally and often exhibited with the artwork. These are then prints are sold and I've also seen them on postcards. Let's just take a moment to feast on some of these beautiful artworks. Savanda is an award-winning artist. In 2013, Savanda received the Standard Bank Young Artist Award. In 2014, she was given the Johannesburg Alumni Dignitas Award. In 2017, she was awarded the Smithsonian National Museum of African Arts Award. Her artworks also form part of some major collections, such as the Toledo Museum of Art, the Spencer Museum of Art, the National Museum of African Arts in Washington. She has had various solo exhibitions and also been a part of lots of group exhibitions. She has exhibited internationally, London, New York, Paris, Texas, Brazil, Cuba, Senegal, Turkey. Marie is a South African artist going from strength to strength. Globally, she is loved and respected because her work really really hits a chord and discusses colonialism in a new way. Remember that colonialism didn't just happen in South Africa but in all the colonies across our globe so there's a lot of international communities which Sophie really resonates with. And that is the amazing artist Marie Sabanda. Lillian Gray and I love teaching art history. I hope you guys enjoyed it. If you did, please like and subscribe. It really helps our channel to continue making amazing art history stories. Let's social, meet me on our socials, Facebook, Instagram, and be sure to read our blog.